Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by, by Tri-County Logging. Experienced in sustainable forestry practices, Tri-County Logging can help you manage your property by keeping your woods healthy and generate income. Serving Southern and Mid-Michigan for nearly 50 years, tricountylogging.com. We fight the battles no one hears about. We drop into the middle of firefights to rescue others. And act as one-man air traffic control towers. We're the ones who go before all others. Join the fight. Hi everyone, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Silik, and we've got an exciting show in store for you this week. I'll take you out for a fishing trip on Saginaw Bay where we get to meet some heroes here in Michigan who did their part to help out when disaster struck last year in the town of Sanford. You won't want to miss that story. And Jimmy and Jordan have some other great stories in store for us this week. Well, that's right, Jenny. We do have a few more stories on this week's show. We're actually going to kick things off on the Grand River doing a little catfish fishing. You won't want to miss that. Two different techniques, some great fish there. And we're also going to have a new product to show you this week in the archery world that if you shoot a red dot scope, this might be something you want to check out. Lots of brand new stuff on this week's show. You stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors What a beautiful day in the woods Someday our children all will see This is their finest legacy The wonder and the love of Michigan As the wind comes whispering through the trees The sweet smell of nature's in the air Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By Alta Equipment Company, providing sales, rentals, service, and parts because uptime matters. From earth moving to landscaping and light construction, Alta offers over 50 brands across seven Michigan locations to serve you. More information online or 844-GO, the number two, Alta. By G5 Outdoors, makers of the Quest and Prime bows, manufactured and designed in Memphis, Michigan. G5 offers a line of archery bows, broadheads, and accessories on the web at g5outdoors.com. DTE believes to lead, we have to do what's right. So we're tripling renewables and cutting carbon emissions in half over the next 10 years. DTE. see this morning um, in some fast water here with Brett it's kind of one of the best parts about this job is getting to meet new people Brett's only 22 he works at the outdoorsman over in Jenison kind of grew up in that area fishes that a lot and uh, is guiding now kind of part-time slash full-time and uh, he's gonna show us some new techniques how to catch catfish today in the Grand River but I think we're gonna probably bump into some smallmouth he even said there's a few sturgeon in here so we're gonna kind of do a few different tactics today but it's a beautiful day we're in some crazy fast water right downtown. In fact, WGBU, where we drop the show off every week, is right over our shoulder. Should be a lot of fun. So today we're doing some float fishing for catfish. It's a little bit of an unusual technique for catfish. Most guys don't think of doing that, but uh, it seems to be very effective. We're using a float fishing setup here. So all I have here is a hook, some shot, and a float. I just have enough shot here to keep that float mostly sunk in the water so we can tell when we get a bite. 
Uh, this is a technique a lot of guys use for steelhead salmon, that sort of thing, very popular for that. And we're going to be using it almost the same way. We're going to target a little bit different spots than we would for salmon steelhead. Uh, catfish like a slower current than those migratory fish, but that's basically the gist of what we're doing today. This time of year we're finding lots of channel catfish. Uh, at high water it seems like we don't catch as many, but we catch mostly quality fish. This time of year when the water's come down a bit, a lot of fish in the boat. We got to pick through some of those smaller fish to find the bigger ones. There are channel catfish and flatheads in here. The flatheads we do catch occasionally with this technique, but we catch a lot more flatheads using cut bait and live bait, uh, specifically like live bluegill, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of the flatheads migrate up here to spawn, so they can be kind of hit or miss for the flatheads, but those are the biggest fish in the river this time of year. We do catch some quality fish up to 40, 50 pounds even. Huge channel cat. Yep, spring right over. Hey! <laughs> that was awesome. What a fun fighting fish. Nice job, Captain. Beautiful fish, good work. Man, those are fun to fight. Look at the head on that thing. That's a big old channel, that's probably a master angle channel cat. Very well, close. that is a ton of fun. Such a cool way to fish. I love that bobber fishing, because that's kind of, everybody grows up, and we don't call them a bobber out here, you call them a float, to be technical, <laughs> but it's, you know, you see that go down, and uh, it's just a fun way to fish, and these, in this current, man, they just fight so good. It's, it's a lot of fun. When it comes to popular rivers in our state, the ones that jump to mind might be the PM or the Asabo, maybe the Big Manistee. But one that doesn't get the attention it should for the variety of fish to catch is the Grand River. The Grand is a great fishery year round. Any time of year you can have a very productive day of fishing on this river. A lot of migratory fish, a lot of resident fish. Really underappreciated smallmouth fishery. Uh, very good for catfish. I've caught numerous sturgeon each season out here. The steelhead run is phenomenal. Very, very good. Uh, good runs of salmon in the fall. Lots of uh, gar. A lot of people like to target gar here. Uh, carp for people who are into targeting carp. That's popular as well. Uh, but there's a huge volume of, of fish in this river. A great biomass. Lots of food. Lots of nutrients. So uh, I know the Grand gets kind of a bad rap, but it's cleaned up a lot from, from what it used to be, and there are lots of fish here. It's pulling pretty good. Sure is. Very nice. Nice, solid fish. Yeah, good job, young fella. He's actually a nice looking one. Look at how nice and green. Yeah. Real clear. So while you're holding these, important to know the spine on their dorsal fin and on each of the pectoral fins. Especially with smaller fish, these things tend to be very sharp before they're worn down. So those will get you pretty good if you're not careful. Just put your hand right behind it, eh? Yep, I like to put my hands right behind that. So as long as you're and underneath. And most of the weight of this fish is held by this hand and this is just to kind of keep it straight. So. Good looking fish, nice job. Pretty fish. Can't complain with that. Beautiful. With lots of fish boated, we opted to change strategies. Our plan now was to move quite a ways downriver and target some fish with cut bait. Now we're going to be throwing out set lines with cut bait. So I'm going to be using either a full size bluegill or half a bluegill. All I'm doing here is I got a three way swivel. My main line is 65 pound braid. I got a three ounce pyramid to about a two and a half foot chunk of 30 pound mono with a six out circle hook. And all I'm gonna do is set up three or four of those with a half or full bluegill and I'm gonna set them as close to uh, the spot where the fish are sitting as I can. Well, pretty much since I could walk, I was out on the water fishing as long as I can remember, catching anything I could and uh, I grew up sort of in the Holland area actually, but I would come over to the Grand quite often because I just knew there was a lot of 
fish in the Grand, a lot of diversity of fish. And I kind of grew to like catfish a lot. They grow to big sizes, they're aggressive. And uh, when I didn't have a boat available, it was something I could catch from shore. Between that and steelhead and salmon fishing, now I do a full-time guide service for the outdoorsmen. So uh, guiding does add a different aspect to it for sure. It's uh, a little more stressful, I would say, just because you have expectations on you. But uh, I, I do enjoy that part of it, and I love watching people catch fish and having a great time. So I think it's I've been a really good transition. That hat is like a shovel. They can just sit yeah. right on the bottom in fast current, and they don't even feel it. Yeah, he was just kind of nipping at it, and then you just, boom, yeah. just set it and go. Those flatheads are much more predatory. They like to eat live fish or, you know, a, a fluttering chunk of fish, something that's moving. Mm. They're, a, they're a fish that hunts more so than the channel catfish. Channel catfish will eat a lot of dead other fish off the bottom, things like okay. that. They will eat live fish, but not like flathead. Flathead are a straight predator. And you had that right up tight against the blowdown then, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Yep, so they're hiding in the shade this time of day. A little bit deeper water. 15, 20 minutes, shade. if you're not bit, then pick up and move. Yep, I like to keep moving often, yep. Yeah, we're gonna hit, I think, one more spot, maybe two. We're gonna pause here, and uh, supposedly there is a lunch option here on the uh, boat. Uh, we hear that there's gonna be some grilled brats, potentially, so we gotta see what that's all about. But we just tucked into the shade here because it's about 90 degrees or so. We're gonna put out some rods, but there's a good blowdown right across the river, so we're gonna eat and then go over there and see if we can catch one or two more. But um, did really well up there, that fast water and those channel cats, and we got one uh, flathead in the boat. We're gonna see if we can catch one or two more, but it's been a perfect day so far, and couldn't ask for a better day, and, and we've met a new friend, so it's about as good as it gets. Nice quality fish. That's a toad! There's a flathead for you. Nice job! Wow! Fish. Dang. Out of the jungle. Out of the jungle, that's right. Sometimes you gotta get into some tough spots <laughs> to find them. Nice fish! What a day on the river. Lots of big, hard-fighting fish. Special thanks to Brett for showing us just what is possible on a hot summer day on the Grand River here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Many of you may remember in May of 2020, as we are all trying to figure out how to deal with the pandemic, the town of Sanford over in Midland County was dealing with another tragedy. Well, a lot of volunteers helped out and our good friend Lance Valentine was able to take a few of those volunteers out for a day of fishing as a way to say thank you. We are taking for the folks who volunteered and gave their time and energy to kind of help uh, the community get back together there after the uh, dam broke up in Sanford. So we've been trying to do this. We tried to, we had five groups lined up. We've been trying to do this for a while. This is our fourth group and the first group we've actually got out because of bad weather. So uh, I saw a PBS special about uh, the dam break and all the people that showed up to really help rebuild the community from all over the country. So I reached out to a friend of mine that lives in Sanford and said, hey, I'd like to do something kind of kind of nice for the volunteers. So we got a five groups and unfortunately this is our first group we've gotten out so we'll get the other guys out at some point but uh, just kind of saying thank you for all the effort and all the time they put into um, rebuild a community that really needed some help so looking forward to a good time today we are headed out of Linwood Beach Marina we're gonna head all the way up to Saganine Bar so we've got about a 15 mile boat ride fishing has been pretty good we had a good morning this morning uh, fishing has been really good up there so Hopefully by the time we get there, the fish are still there. But uh, we're gonna take about a 15 minute, or about a 15 mile boat ride. It takes about a half hour to get up there. So uh, a little boat ride this morning, but we should be able to get, uh, we're gonna be out for three, four hours. We should be able to get nice size walleye tonight. So it should be a good trip. It was great to be out with Lance Valentine again. And before he could even get all the lines set, we had our first fish of the evening. Sanford strong volunteer, Joe Pillars, was the first to haul in a Saginaw Bay walleye. Nice and easy now. Go ahead. Nice and easy. 
How's it feel? I love it. It's great to have a fish on. That's why we came. Lift her out. Lift her out up there. Got it. Oh, yeah. That's a nice one. Purple has been the color the last couple days. Purple's always a good color on Saginaw Bay. Purple or pink. So a little bit of purple, a little bit of pink. There you go. Just a typical 16, 17 inch. Yeah. Saginaw Bay right. Number one. Sweet. Number one. So this is what we're looking for right here. These are deep water weed beds, kind of just scattered clumps of weeds and the fish are kind of right in them and they're coming up. Our baits are up here at about eight feet and these fish are sitting in these deep weed beds and they're coming up and grabbing our bait. So if you don't have weeds on your screen, we're not catching any fish or anything. There's a nice big weed bed right there and you'll get five or six fish, seven, eight fish living in those weed beds and they'll come up and grab our bait. So we're trying to find these weed beds, these deeper weed beds at 10, 11, 12 feet of water has been the key the last couple days uh, up here on Saginaw Bay. You know, location, you can't catch them where they're not, right? So right now they're, they're in these shell water. So a lot of guys, when it gets hot, they head deep. Well, a lot of the bait fish and a lot of the walleyes actually head in shell if you've got good green weed growth. So don't think just because it's hot, surface temperatures are high, you have to go shallow sometimes, or go deep, sometimes going shallow, you'll actually catch more fish than going deep because these fish are in here where it's a little cooler. There's a lot of bait in the weeds and they can hide, ambush uh, prey like they are baits. And don't forget about going shallow when it gets warm. It's always nice to hear a few gems of wisdom from the professor of teach and fishing, but Lance was here to honor four great guys who offered up their resources to help any way they could when tragedy struck in Midland County last year. In mid-May, the area experienced a huge influx of rain as a very large storm stalled there, dumping several inches of water in a very short time. Consequently, two area dams failed, the Edenville Dam and then the Sanford Dam, causing devastating damage to many properties in the area, including the town of Sanford. Troy Irving was there to help. Uh, there was so much water that the dams physically didn't fail, but they stopped holding water back. So water pouring over the top of the dams, even with the floodgates open all the way. And that had Wixom's level rise so much that Edenville Dam, was taking water over the top. The earth dike that goes around the side then gave way and that let all of the water start flowing through. It actually cut where the river goes around. It cut straight, a path straight through and diverted where the river is now. Um, that went down and Sanford had the same issue of, of the side earth dike giving way and water flowing down from there. So you, you essentially had three lakes worth of water rushing down toward the city of Midland, which, which then flooded uh, all the way up to almost Main Street in the downtown area. There were, there were whole homes missing, just swept off their foundation, and when people got back the next day, they found a cement slab and their home was just gone. It, it affected thousands of people, but everyone lived, and, and that's what's important. I work for Midland County 911. I was working the day of the flood. We started with um, the Edenville Dam breaking, and from there we started sending out wireless alerts to people around the Sanford area and then into the Midland area once we found out that the Sanford Dam wasn't going to hold. I went, and it was actually my responsibility to go to the Midland City Fire Department and work with command there to establish operations with different rescue teams across the city and we, we orchestrated all of all of the city operations along with the National Guard that came in and the I believe they had over 14 different neighboring fire and um, law enforcement agencies come in to help it was it was quite a quite a procedure but we were very happy to say that we had zero fatalities um, no casualties through the whole event which given the scale of the event the, the state and national agencies have said is is quite remarkable um, most of that goes to the responders and the citizens, everyone from the volunteers that helped at the shelters to the fire departments, the police that went around and got everybody out, and the citizens themselves have taken it serious enough to, when they got the alerts, to, to pack up and leave right away. Because it was a matter of minutes and there, there wasn't much else that, that they could have done other than just leave. Once folks began to return to Sanford in the following days, these Sanford Strong volunteers took it upon themselves to help any way they knew how. Justin Frost started by feeding people. The first couple of days went downtown and I actually bought a big stack of pizzas and walked around town and handed them out to people and then uh, 
over the next couple of weeks did some YouTube live auctions and raised some money for some folks and then uh, actually helped a group of volunteers I kind of headed up a project to restore the cemetery in Sanford to uh, I don't know kind of help rebuild things give people a sense of things getting back to normal I guess and uh, ended up resetting 256 headstones that summer and uh, went in and helped some people put subfloor in their house little things here and there these Sanford Strong volunteers weren't just locals either. Joe Pillars wasn't even from Sanford, but came to help and just never left. He has since relocated to the area. Well, I was living in Lapeer when the dams broke and uh, seeing it on the news, uh, I just, uh, my heart went out to the people that suffered the loss. And so I started coming up with my church uh, and doing some work, uh, helping people, organization, known as Ides that we got hooked up with, uh, donated some garden sheds that we were able to build on 20 sites for folks. And, uh, and then I spent time helping with the rebuild, uh, everything in construction to you know, get the house back to a livable state. But it's so good that help come from so many people because there's so much that had to be done. It's, it's quite overwhelming to look at the whole picture. Rick Hatfield from Sanford started out helping a few family members and ended up running a dump truck and headed up a crew to help clear the streets of debris. So we ran six months straight, um, coordinating efforts with other crews, um, gutting homes, um, removing debris off the road, and then rebuilding homes, and coordinated quite a few efforts and rebuilding quite a few homes, and now putting my life back together um, still helping a couple homes rebuild and uh, you know just reaching out and uh, helping people get what they need to, to put their lives back to normal. Over a year later things are still far from normal in Sanford. What used to be lakefront homes are now overlooking an expanse of wasteland that's unsafe to even walk on. There's still quite a bit of uncertainty regarding the restoration of the dams and the communities affected by the storms of 2020. But the town of Sanford has been resilient, and thanks to the good folks like Justin, Troy, Joe, and Rick, they will prevail and thrive the way Michiganders have always done. Special thanks to Lance Valentine for recognizing these heroes and taking them out for a day of fun here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Well, when it comes to the world of the shooting sports, red dot scopes have been very popular on shotguns and pistols for years. Well, they are becoming more and more accessible in the world of archery as well. A few weeks back, I was able to see and learn about a new product in the archery world. Tim Zelenkov has come up with a new way for archers to use red dot scopes in hopes of tighter and tighter groups. We've been uh, shooting red dots for about 30 years. And the problem with red dots in the past is when you sighted them in at 20 yards, you were kind of stuffed with it at, at 20 yards. So we came and made the red dot sight, you know, so it was adjustable. Now with, you know, basically just a few clicks, you know, we can go from 20 to 60 yards. And what's the advantage of that? Well, we don't have to, uh, you know, gap shoot or hold over, you know, at an animal. If he's at 40 yards, we don't have to hold at the top of his back. Um, we can still put the... Uh, the dot right on his vitals. So this is what we've always um, kind of had when we were sh shooting red dots for the last 30 years. We would use a tube style uh, red dot, which is very intuitive. Um, it's round, our eye wants to center the dot. It gives us, you know, more of like a, looking through a toilet paper tube, so to speak. Um, and it just makes you very easy to center the dot. We went to the rail system. So now, if you already have a red dot, all you have to do is, is buy the mount and the rail, stick it on, and you're good to go. With the possibility of using a rail system, putting a red dot system on your bow is now much easier. The red dot scope on bows has been possible for years, but the ability to move the dot up and down allows for pinpoint accuracy from 20 yards to about as far as you would want to shoot. The difference with a red dot versus a, a pin sight uh, whereas with a pin, maybe you're having the fletching in the corner of your mouth or your string touching your nose. Our anchor point is much less important with a red dot. Um, uh, we center the dot, if we're, if we're torquing the bow, that dot's going to move left and right. Uh, and 
we just keep our head straight and center the dot right here. We're not, so whether we're moving our head one way or the other, picture you had a, a gun in a gun vise and you moved your head, the dot will move, but you never moved the gun. So it's this that makes a difference, not where our head is. With no need for a kisser button or a peep sight, this kind of system is very easy for folks to learn and eliminate extra weight on the string. The whole red dot, we're not trying to look through the scope and find the dot. We're just focusing on the target and the dot just becomes in our vision. So we're, we never focus from, from peep sight to pins to the target and then back making sure our bow's level and we're just looking at the target. The first red dot scope I ever saw was the one Claude Pollington put on his Oneida bows. They have come a long way since then, and now with the folks wanting to target shoot up to about 100 yards, it's fun to see how sportsmen and women continue to push the envelope to find more accuracy. If you'd like more info on Tim, you can find his information in the credits of the show. Thanks for joining us this week for Michigan Out of Doors. Make sure you join us in upcoming weeks. We've got all sorts of great things headed your way. We'll take you on a couple more big lake fishing trips, one of which is our annual trip with Bob Garner out of Frankfurt. You won't want to miss that trip. We'll have some dog training tips for you. We'll take you down to Belle Isle to show you what some kids in Detroit are doing to enjoy Michigan's great outdoors. You won't want to miss that. If you'd like to see where we are and where we're headed next, you can always check us out online. Well, that's right, Jenny. Online, always a great way to kind of keep tabs on us. You can do that through our website. We have full episodes of the show there every week. We're also on most of the social media platforms as well as YouTube, so lots of places you can check us out and make sure that you are checking us out over the next several weeks. Lots of good fishing to be had around the state of Michigan as we get ready for fall. It's just a few short weeks away. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And if we don't see you in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by do you dream of somewhere bigger than your backyard? You can get there with Greenstone. Whether you want to hunt, fish, hike, or just watch the sunset, we're ready to help you own your place in the great outdoors. To learn more, visit GreenstoneFCS.com. Closed captioning provided by Marvo Mineral, makers of Lucky Buck, deer management products including minerals to supplement deer diets year-round to improve health and antler growth. When I want to fire away I am a Michigan man Changing seasons paint the scene Like rainbow trout in a hidden stream The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees I am